Thanks, Dave. Good morning. Welcome to 2019. Man, this is going to be a great year. I was so excited when Dave let us know about the uh, finances of how God blessed in the life of our church. Thank you for your generous giving. That goes to the service of the Lord, and so what a blessing that is. Well, Dave, you stole my thunder. I was going to go into Penelope and Terry and Brian and Michelle, and uh, we're going to miss you guys. But I agree, we are sending you out as missionaries, and so thank you for your service for being here. I love coming and worshiping the Lord. I hope you do too. It's a joy, it's an honor to worship Him in this house in St. Charles, Missouri. I thought about the spiritual resolutions for 2019. 2018 was a great year. I believe 2019 is going to be an even greater year. I want to give you kind of a lowdown before I get started with the, where we're going about where I want to take us this year through our sermons and sermon series. We're going to start a series next week. Uh, we've been talking a lot about who we are here at Ridgecrest. So we desire to worship, we desire to grow, and we desire to share. From talking with the staff, we met together at a retreat and said, you know what, I think it'd be great if we dive further into that. So we're going to spend a series on worship, grow, share, what exactly that looks like for who we are here at Ridgecrest. After that, we're going to have an awesome revival this year. Yes, I'm going to call it that. We're having a team coming in to lead us uh, in an opportunity of worship. We're going to have a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, uh, and it's going to be a great time. I'm really, really looking forward to it. You're going to hear a lot more about that on, on the way in the weeks and months to come. And I'm going to take us through a series on how to serve. We're going to spend the summer learning about the joy and honor and blessing to serve the Lord. So we're going to push for a super summer of service. <laughs> I'm not going to say that three times. But that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to encourage our hearts and lives, and we're going to get out, and we're going to serve this community. I'm very, very excited about that. We've got a lot of details coming about that. And then at the end of the year, I want to do a through the Bible study of First Peter. And so we're going to work through the passage of First Peter. I've prayed a lot about it. I've prayed hard about it. Uh, and uh, it, it's going to be pretty deep through it. But I'm looking forward to teaching that. And so that's coming up in 2019. I hope you're excited about that as much as I am. But let's think about the resolutions for 2019. Some of us have made resolutions, right? There are some great resolutions out there. I, for one, have made a couple New Year's resolutions. I am reading through the Bible again in, uh, in a year, so that's my goal this year as well. I'm, I've started working out. I'm extremely sore. It's painful. But some of these things we think about and say, it's a start, it's a new beginning. And so let's think this morning about some of the resolutions that are the top this year resolutions. Number one, the top one is diet or eating healthier. I thought this may help. You know, some of us, that may help a lot with that type of thing. The number two, uh, which actually, for the first one, uh, the funny thing is, is last year, it was spend more time with family and friends, but this year it's diet or eating healthier. Number two is exercise more. I like this. Exercise, some uh, motivation is required. I thought that was pretty good motivation to uh, exercise. Uh, la last year, it was fitness, so right along the same type of thing. Number three uh, is lose weight is the top resolution. Number three is lose weight. Uh, sorry for the slide. It must have gotten messed up. But, uh, it's a, you know, I like to lose, late, lose weight, but I hate losing. I'll, I'll fix that for the next service. Right? I mean, we hate losing, but losing weight's cool. Number four, number four was save more and spend less. Now, I put up Dave Ramsey here. We are starting the first week of February uh, on Wednesday night. If you're interested, a Financial Peace University class. Uh, you can sign up. As the information is in the foyer at the Get Connected Center if you're interested. If you've never taken this class, I would encourage you to take it, to learn how to save, to learn how to spend appropriately. It's a great class, and that number four resolution most people put is to save more and spend less. Number five is to learn a new skill or hobby. Uh, I put this up there. Does that count as a hobby? Some people think it does. To learn a new skill or hobby. Some of you are like, man, I want to take up this. I want to do this. I want to do that. I, for one, I would love to learn Spanish. So if anybody knows Spanish, you can teach me. Okay. All right. That's mine. I want to learn Spanish. I think it'd be really cool. Uh, so I can say no habla espanol anymore. I can say si habla espanol. Yes, I do speak it. Number six was quit smoking. This is what happens. Cigarettes are like squirrels. Sorry, it's uh, off on the screen there. Man, I got to fix that. I can't believe it popped up like that. But, uh, oh, 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 hey. 
They're perfectly harmless until you put one in your mouth and light it on fire, right? Cigarettes are like squirrels. Some, some of you get that one later. It's a, it's a tough one for you. So the quit smoking was number six. What about number seven was read more? Read more. That's a good one. It's called reading. It's how people install new software into their brains. That's what we do. Some are encouraging to read more. What about number eight is find another job. These people, I guarantee you, are looking for another job. Well, stop is not spelled S-O-T-P if you can't read it on the screen. And then the do not enter sign has an enter only sign. What are you supposed to do? Probably looking for another job, but that is actually number eight. As many people this year are saying, you know what, I want a new job. Number nine is drink less alcohol is number nine. Not surprising. That one's actually normally always on the top 10 resolution list. It's interesting. I want to bring your attention to this. UK, in the UK, they did a campaign called Dry January. And what they did was they took 600 participants and encouraged them and said, let's not drink any alcohol in the month of January. And what they discovered was this. All of those people experienced positive side effects after they were done getting off of withdrawal, such were sleeping better, losing weight, and feeling more energetic. That's what occurs when you stop drinking. So interesting there, number nine. And then the last tenth resolution was spend more time with family and friends. That went from number one last year to being number ten now, this year. So I know that we are all encouraged to be able to think about that in the future, to spend more time. And you may say to me this morning, it's difficult spending time with family because my family is temperamental. Half the time they're temper and half the time they're mental. (laughs) That's just the way it is sometimes in life. And so you enjoy your family time. But here's the key to catch out of all these resolutions. And for many of us this morning, we have made resolutions. Researchers have discovered this, that 60% of the U.S. citizens and U.S. people will make New Year's resolutions. But here's the deal. Only 8% are going to successfully achieve them. This morning, what if God were to say to us this morning, here are the things that I want you to strive for to make resolute in your life for 2019. What would those things be? We just finished a series on what is your gift to God? What can you bring to the Lord? That surrendered heart, that life focused on Him. And as I finished off this series, I encouraged us in our hearts to have that surrendered heart. And when I did that, I quoted a couple passages to you, and I want to reread those passages. In Deuteronomy 11.1, in the Old Testament, the Bible says this, You shall love therefore, uh, you shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. And then the New Testament even carried that over in 1 John 2, 3-4. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. So whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So for 2019, I would like to look this morning with us how to strive to meet the commandments of the word of the Lord. And when we do this, I believe our hearts and minds will be focused on serving Christ. And when we focus our hearts and minds on serving Christ, I believe we're going to meet a lot of those resolutions that we desire to meet. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 11 through 28. And we're going to go through this text rather quickly, but we're going to see in this passage that Paul was really setting up before this passage. He was getting the church ready for the day of the Lord that would be coming. I love how Dr. J. Vernon McGee once titled this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at this morning as the 22 commandments for Christians. Beyond the, 12, beyond the Ten Commandments given in Exodus chapter 20, in this short time we're going to examine 22 commandments that God gives Christians to strive to follow through with in our lives. And so these can be found in this passage in 1 Thessalonians. These spiritual resolutions that we want to set in our hearts and our lives can be found in saying, you know what, I want to follow the commandments of the Lord. Well, how do we do that? Let's look at these commandments together. The first part of these commandments really reflect our attitude towards others, that it must reflect God's love. When we have an attitude of this understanding of God's love, we can reflect that to others. And so in verses 9 through 10 of this passage, to set us up, this is what Paul here was explaining to those Thessalonian believers. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him so how can we be sacrificial and show the love of god that he has showed to us through his son's death i think that's a great thing to start off in 2019 is if you've never made a decision for jesus you catch it here 
God has not destined us for wrath, but for salvation through Jesus Christ. That's a great thing to start off the new year is making a relationship with Jesus clear in your heart and life. But how do we do this? How do we have this attitude toward others that reflects God's love? I think the first thing that we could do is in this passage, we're going to see some of these commandments that he gives to us, is that we've got to love our neighbor. Look at verse 11 with me in this passage. He says, therefore, encourage one another. Encourage one another. This word encourage could also be in maybe your version of the Bible. It could be the word comfort. Now this word is not the same word used of the Holy Spirit in John's Gospel, where he often talked about it from the word, this is where we derive the word from parakaleo, not from the word parakletos, which is different, talking about the Holy Spirit. This is talking more about comfort and encouragement and reassurance. So this is what he says to us this morning. Paul would say to the Thessalonian church and to us as well, that we need to be encouraging toward each other. You know, there's a lot of things going on in our world that would make us not feel so encouraged. We could look at the immigration concerns and the president that we have, the stock market, the deranged man that just murdered four people in our city. We could look at the school shootings that have happened, the negativity in the media. And we could say there's not much that you can encourage each other about from the world's perspective. Or maybe you've had a rough 2018 and maybe you've lost loved ones and had health concerns or you've seen the decline of Christianity in the world and you're going, what is happening in the United States of what is going on in my life? We could all use a bit of encouragement. And this morning, I believe the Word of God gives us some encouraging things. We can encourage one another. In this passage, he gives the second command here for believers in Christ, and it's to build up one another. And he says, just as you are doing. To build up one another, your version may say to edify one another. The word used here in the Greek is actually the word that comes from the root word where we get the word house for in the New Testament. In other words, Paul uses this word to really explain that just like building a house from the ground up, so does our way of encouraging one another and building each other up. We start from the foundation, from the ground up, and we encourage one another. You know, we can build each other up in many different ways. We can do so with our words. We can be kind with what we say. We can do so with our attitude. We can be joyful. We can smile. We can show the love of Christ in that way. We can also be able to build each other up by our actions, what we do, how we help, how we assist each other. You know, we've got a lot of ministries that do that here in the life of our church. A lot of people that serve faithfully and help those who have needs. You know, in verse 12, he says this, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. It's important to catch this key thing, to respect. This would be the third command that he asks for believers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and do this thing called admonishing you. Well, what the Bible really talks about here, that recognize or respect those could really be translated this way, to know. In other words, to know those who have charge over you and give instruction. Well, that could be your Bible study teachers and your life groups. That could be your discipleship teachers throughout the week. That could be your mom, your dad. That could be your grandparents. Or more specifically, even that could be your pastor. To know and to hold them up in a high regard. Those that serve are to be honored. And I think we need to remember that. Those that serve faithfully in the Lord are to be honored. James 3.1 even put it this way. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. It's a blessing to be a teacher, but... To understand this, we've got to know and respect them, to esteem them very highly in love because of their work is the next command. This would be the fourth one found in verse 13. To esteem them, this word to really honor and to cherish and to respect for who they are, to hold them in a high regard. It's a blessing to not only know your teachers, but also to appreciate those who teach you the word of God. In this passage, he does talk about those Bible leaders in the church and Really, I wonder if something was going on maybe in the church in Thessalonica during that time period. And so he wanted to make sure that he encouraged the believers to be faithful to who was teaching them the word of God. But notice here what he says to esteem them in the heart of love. The author here he chose to use the word agape in this form, this unconditional love that we have for each other, the highest form of love to make sure that you love those who teach the word of God. And he goes into the fifth commandment for believers. This is what he tells us how we can love our neighbor and treat everybody with respect. He says to be at peace amongst yourselves. 
That'd be the fifth one. You know, all throughout the New Testament, there are many times when we are called to be at peace. Romans 14, 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual building. Or even in 2 Corinthians 13, 11, finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Or even Ephesians 4, 3, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Or Colossians 3, 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Or even James 3.18, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I think you're catching it here. The Bible calls us to be at peace with one another. But here in the text, I believe that Paul was making sure that he kept in line with the context of what he was talking about. In other words, he was really referring to being at peace amongst those biblical leaders that you have. Whether it be your parents or your grandparents or your life group teachers, your pastors, whatever the case may be, to be at peace amongst themselves. What a great command of the Lord. We've got to love our neighbor and treat them with respect. But also, I notice in this passage, we must help our neighbor. Look at verse 14 as he goes into the sixth command. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idol. Admonish, that word could also be the word warn caution this clear word of caution to those who are heading in the wrong direction such were those who really failed to serve the lord and serve the church maybe with their spiritual gifts that they have like first corinthians 14 12, 12 talks about or maybe that they fail to give a portion of what they have to the lord or maybe even fail to support the church leadership in the context of what he was referring to here to the church at thessalonica but the word idle here is also a different, interesting word. That admonish or warn, caution, heads up. But who are you to warn? The Bible passage here tells us to warn the idle. That word could also be translated the unruly. In other words, these were Christians who maybe tried to get as close to the line of being an acceptable Christian as possible. In other words, they were Christians who maybe didn't try their best at being a Christian. They were unruly. Maybe he said, you know what, how far is the line of this is sin and I'm going to try to get right up next to it and just hover around it. That's this person he's talking about here, the unruly that were trying to be what they wanted to be and maybe not what God wanted them to be. So in this passage, we've got to be careful. We've got to warn those who maybe are in that state of mind inside of the church. Give a word of caution to say, hey, get back on track. And maybe this is the greatest time of all to say it's 2019. Don't be idle. Don't be unruly. Let's get moving for the Lord. What about the seventh commandment that he gives to believers is this. He says to encourage the faint hearted. The word encourage is also the word comfort. In the context, the Thessalonian believers really needed some encouragement and comfort because of what Paul was teaching them. If you remember what he's teaching them, he's talking about the end times. And back in 1 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, listen to what he said, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those who do not have a hope. In other words, the Thessalonian believers needed to be assured that those who died in the faith would be in heaven, and they wanted to be encouraged with that. And so he said, you can rejoice because those who believe in the Lord are there with him. But they needed to be comforted encouraged to know that what they were standing up for was true so he says to encourage to comfort now notice who he talks about now he moves away from the unruly the idle christian the, the follower who says you know what i'm gonna try to be really whoever i want to be and not really follow the word of god completely and now he moves into a different category he says to encourage the faint-hearted that word in the greek would really be better translated this it would better be translated small souled the small souled individual in other words, these were the sheep that really worried and were afraid about standing up for Jesus Christ, whereas the unruly were trying to get as close to the edge of acceptable Christian behavior as possible. These were the people that were just downright afraid and scared. Their souls weren't strong in the Lord. They were weak, and not as confident as some other strong believers. Well, Paul here is encouraging the stronger believers in the faith to encourage the weaker believers in the faith. 
Listen, we need more of that. If you haven't read Titus and his work, Titus goes into that. The older, mature mentors helping the younger. We need a lot of help there. So the unruly, the idle, the faint-hearted, the small-souled individuals to warn, to encourage. Then he gives the eighth commandment to us to help the weak, to help the weak. The word help could be also translated uphold, and I think really that would be a better translation of this word because when you oftentimes read the word help, it could maybe single it out to maybe a one-time instance, like just help them once. But I think uphold shows this continual nature of lifting up and encouraging them every step of the way. And so Paul here said in the form of a continual help and assistance, and look who he said it to. This time he adds in the category of the weak. Now, I believe that doesn't refer to the physical weakness that some people have, but the spiritual weakness instead. This most likely refers to those who are fragile in the faith, who have not gone from the milk of the word to the meat of the word. Those that need to continue to grow, and he says to help them, to uphold them, to walk with them along their journey. Listen to what John MacArthur says about the weak, and I think this is rather harsh, but listen to what he says. He says, the weak are always impediments and stumbling blocks to growth and power in the church. And here's what he was getting at in the context of what he was referring to is this, is some people try not to move away from the milk of the word. They just try to stay on it. As opposed to being mature believers in Christ and saying, I'm going to dig into the word of God. I'm going to dig into my relationship with the Lord. I'm going to talk to him in prayer. I'm going to seek him out and study his word. I'm going to come to church and grow together with the body of believers. That's what he's talking about here. The ones that are the weak that say, you know what, I'm just not going to do it. They need a lot of help. They need a lot of uplifting and encouragement. And listen, church, we can do that. We can help the weak. We can encourage them. We can encourage the faint-hearted, the ones who are small-souled. And we can even warn those who are trying to get as close to sending as possible to stay strong and to be firm. And so he gives us this ninth commandment here to say, here's what you do with those people. He says, be patient with all of them. Man, that is tough. One of the one things I was taught early on in the ministry was, Neil, don't don't pray for patience unless you're going to be tested by patience. So we know those of us that we do, we are. Patience, often termed long-suffering, the unruly, the faint-hearted, the small-souled, and the weak Christians are not going to turn over a new leaf overnight. They're not going to change overnight and go, man, I was this, and now I'm going to be this. In other words, it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take encouragement. It's going to take our strength. It's going to take sacrificial love to be there for those that need help, those that need encouragement. We are called to do that, to take the time to mentor, to take the time to disciple those who need to be discipled. And some will require longer than others. We've got to be able to be in it for the long haul, to be patient. I thought about how Jesus was patient with his disciples. Oftentimes the Bible tells us that he commented them as being men of little faith. He was patient with them, and so we must be patient with others. We've got to love our neighbor. We've got to help our neighbor. But also I noticed something else in the commandments that he gives us is we've got to be good to our neighbor. Here's what verse 15 says, and it gives us the 10th commandment here to believers in Christ. He says this, see that no one repays another with evil for evil. It's that turn the other cheek mentality. Not looking for an eye for an eye. Oftentimes in the church we do a great job of wounding each other. Shooting our wounded even. We know just how to attack each other often with our wicked words, our gossip, our slander, and forming cliques and situations where we put ourselves and others down. But somewhere in the Thessalonian church, someone had received evil, and Paul was giving a command for believers not to retaliate. It's a great lesson for each one of us. We must not seek revenge when we're afflicted, but seek forgiveness and reconciliation at all costs. I thought of what Jesus was saying to those believers in Matthew 18, 21 and 22, when Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I shall forgive him? Many as seven times seven, and what was Jesus' response to him? (laughs) I did not say seven times, but 77 times. In other words, keep forgiving. Keep moving forward. Not seeking revenge is the goal. 
to trust and give forgiveness where forgiveness is due. Because if we remember what has happened to us, listen, we have been forgiven much. And we are continually forgiven much for the things that we do against God and against his word. And so don't seek after evil, that 10th command. What about the 11th one this morning? Here it is. Seek after that which is good for one another and for all people to seek after that which is good. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43 through 44, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you to love, to do good to others. Our attitude must be like Christ's attitude. Sacrificial loving those who need love. But what about maybe our second resolution? Our attitude toward others must reflect God's love. But the second thing, our attitude from within must reveal God's salvation that we have. So he gives the 12th command here to rejoice always. Now Paul, Paul really kind of shifts gears here and really turns to the inner heart here. And now he tells the church to rejoice at all times, to be joyful. Now the church here was struggling he had extreme persecution from the outside as well as friction from inside. If you notice, he's been telling the people to encourage one another, the believers, the faithful. And so in this state, he says to be joyful always. You know what drives me crazy sometimes? Is when I meet Christians who aren't joyful. We're called to be joyful of what God has done for us. The lives that we have in Christ. You know, I thought about it this way. Just so you know, Satan always loves a good sourpuss. God has called us to be joyful and excited at who we are. Think about what we can rejoice about. We can rejoice because of who God is and what he can do. We can rejoice because of Christ's redemptive work. He has saved us by his blood on the cross. We can rejoice because, listen, he gave us a Holy Spirit to help us. And we need to help. He's given us that. We can rejoice because of the spiritual gifts he's gifted us. He's rejoiced us and we can rejoice because God knows everything, because God forgives, because he can save, because I can go on and on at the reasons why we can rejoice. But we get the picture, right? Church, we can rejoice. And here's the thing, we're commanded to do so. Think about it. 13, look at the next thing we're commanded to do, to pray without ceasing. Always be in a continual state of prayer. Now, this does not mean that you have to close your eyes. I don't recommend it when you're driving. But many of you do it anyway when you text and drive. That's exactly what you're doing is you're closing your eyes. And here's the deal. He says, you can pray at all times. It doesn't matter where you are and what you're doing. You can pray and talk to the Lord. We're called to do that. To be in that continual state of prayer. Listen to what Stephen Curtis Chapman once sung. Pray, let us pray. Every moment of the day is the right time. There's no bad time to pray. You can pray at all times. The 14th command, what does he give us here in verse 18? Give thanks to all in all circumstances, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. In other words, in every occurrence of your life, you can still give thanks. Now, I know this may be difficult because we have a lot of trials, we have a lot of temptations, we have a lot of persecution. But God calls us to give thanks, to be joyful over the fact that we can even give thanks. The 15th commandment here, he says, do not quench the spirit in verse 19. Now, quench is the word really to extinguish or to stifle. In other words, we must not try to hinder or stop the Holy Spirit's movement in our lives. And so Paul here was really commanding the Thessalonian church to let the spirit have his way in their heart and life. Church, that's what God wants to do. He wants to have his way in our heart and life. Don't stifle it. Don't extinguish it. Don't try to put it out. Allow God to move. Don't try to, try to quench it. I want to make sure that I explain this succinctly here. This word quenching is not the same as the word blasphemy that's used in the scripture of blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. Those are completely different topics. The blasphemy of the Spirit is found in Matthew 12, 31 through 32, which talks about if you blasphemy uh, this, the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven. That's really saying, I don't want God's Spirit in my life. I don't want Him in my life. That's a rejection of God. The quenching here that we're talking about is just having God's Spirit moving in your life, and you're saying, no, I'm not there. I don't want to follow that right now. I want to do what I want to do. So there's a little bit difference in those two categories. I want to make sure that I define that for you. But let's look at the 16th commandment as we move on. Do not despise prophecies, he says in verse 20. Now the Thessalonian believers were not told, they were told here to to not treat with contempt or to look down on prophecies or even prophetic utterances, your version may say. What were these prophecies that were, he was referring to? Most likely, it was either the spoken word or the written word. 
But here in the text, I wonder if he was really referring to the Word of God, what God's Word was doing in their lives. In other words, don't look down on the Word of God and what it tells you to do. That's a great thing as we're looking at the commandments of what God calls us to do. Don't look down on these. Take them to heart and understand that. I think about this because the word prophecy is used here even in Revelation 22 to refer to the Word of God. Listen to what John said. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to them the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away and share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in the book. Don't treat with contempt or look down upon the word of God. You know, sometimes it feels like we do this, though, doesn't it? Sometimes we look at the word of God where it calls us to do one thing and we say, you know what, I'm going to do something else. That would bring us into the category of that unruly or idle Christian that he said, be careful about. Maybe have some words of warning and caution about. Or maybe some today that are in that situation of the unruly or maybe the faint-hearted or the weak. And I would encourage you today to look at the word of God and know that it is the word of God. To stand strong in it. So what do we do with the word of God? He encourages those, the 17th commandment here for believers is to test everything. To examine it, to test it to make sure it's right that we're really what he's referring to here is to look at everything to see if it's right or if it's wrong if it's good or if it's evil to see if it's authentic is really what he's referring to in this text and to be able to do that is difficult i think as believers in christ we maybe fall short a little bit here where we don't put enough things to test we don't test the things that we should be testing and so he encourages test it make sure it's godly or not godly right if it's wrong so then he gives us an 18th commandment to hold fast to that which is good not only do we examine everything and we test it but we also hold fast to the things that are good that are right that are true that are honorable that are holy and we say you know that's a good thing i'm gonna run toward that aren't these great commandments i mean for some of us we look at it and go yep that's common sense but this is exactly what he wanted the church to know is here's what we need to know how we can be fruitful and have a great life in christ To remain faithful and steadfast. And the 19th thing he says is really, this kind of helps us all out here. He says, abstain from every form of evil is the 22nd verse there in the 19th commandment. To abstain. That word really means this, to hold oneself away from. In other words, we must not put ourselves in a predicament that is harmful or dangerous to our position in Christ that could cause us to sin. In other words, we keep ourselves away from things like that as much as possible. If something causes us to sin, we be careful and we say, you know what, I want to get away from that. I want to uphold myself. I want to abstain from that. I don't want to do that anymore. To hold yourself back from, that's what he's saying. Well, what does he say to hold yourself back from? Look at it. He says, every form of evil. And as a Christian, this is what we're called to do. Stay away from every form of evil that is out there. To be, as Philippians 2.15 talks about, to be above reproach. To be strong and faithful in the Lord. Our attitude toward others has got to reflect God's love. And our attitude really must be sanctified in this situation. It reveals our salvation of who we are in Christ. But thirdly, this morning as we close, our attitude must be sanctified by God's grace. It's God that helps us to accomplish this task. You and I cannot accomplish this task on our own we need the holy spirit we need god we need his help to encourage and to help us walk in this newness of life each day that we live and so he says this in verses 23 through 24 which is not a part of the commands you're welcome but it's more of an encouragement now may the god of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ and he who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it you know we are made holy and right by jesus christ he's the one that has accomplished that task for us he's the one that can help us to do this so then he gives a 20th commandment to the christian believers and he says this pray for us pray for us verse 25 helps us to lay down this fact of pray for us now listen i believe here in this room we could all enjoy prayer from somebody else praying for us It's a beautiful thing to pray for somebody else. Paul here in the context was referring to himself, Silas, and Timothy. We know that from 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 2, to pray for them because they needed prayer. 
I believe there's a lot of people in this room that could use some prayer. I'll tell you this this morning, I pray for you. I know many of you pray for each other, but I pray for you, and especially those of you that are members here, that have your picture in the photo directory. And if you don't, you need to get it, because that's my prayer list every morning. <laughs> so if you want to be prayed for, let us know. We can take your picture, I can put it in there, and we can be, I can pray for you. But we all need that. Now verse 20, well verse 26 is the 21st commandment and it just got serious. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Whoo! Watch out now. Let me give context. During the 50 AD century when this was written in this time period, that was a customary greeting with the believers in that time period was to show love and concern and care. They would greet each other with a kiss of genuine love and affection. Now, I'm not suggesting we go around kissing each other. All right, that's not what I'm getting at, and I don't believe that's really kind of what Paul was getting at here in this text of the Scripture. Today, it could be a show of love with a handshake, a fist bump, or a hug. It can do just that. But the key is that we show that love and affection toward each other as believers in Christ. Here's the deal. We're commanded to do so. It's a good thing. 22nd commandment, I leave you with this and finish up the passage here also. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Read meaning implied to speak aloud. And here's what I've done. Church, I've just completed it this morning. To read it to each other. And here's what we can be encouraged to each other as well. To tell others about this. About what we've been called to do. For the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will be with you all. Is the end passage. Verse 28. We've been commanded to do great things this morning. I believe we can strive to serve Christ as best as we can, knowing that His grace covers a multitude of sins and He loves us. But He wants us to live our lives in the best way that we can for Him. Dr. Cantor once said this, and I love this quote, and I end on this. He says, I do not follow God's commands because I have to, but because I want to, to bring joy and happiness to my God and Savior. I think that's it. We follow it because we know it brings joy, it brings gladness to our loving Lord. Spiritual resolutions for 2015, we can strive to follow the commands that God has laid out for us in his word. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this morning, for what you've shown us in your word, these resolutions, these 22 commands that we could look at and say, you know what, I can strive to fulfill some of those this year. Maybe all of them. I can strive to serve you, God, faithfully. But I'm thankful, for Lord, for the very fact that, Lord Jesus, you came for sinners, for people who are messed up. And Lord God, we are all sinners fallen short of your glory. And Lord Jesus, you gave your very life for us. You died on a cross for us. Then after you died, you were buried, you rose on the third day that you revealed that you had the power over death. And it had no sting or victory over you, but God, you had the victory. So therefore, we know that you died for us so that we could have everlasting life with you. And there may be somebody in this room that says, you know what, I have never received Jesus into my life. And that would be the great start for 2019. To put my faith and trust in Jesus. To strive to live for him. To be who he's called me to be. And if that's you this morning, you can talk to God and say, God, I'm sorry for the things that I've done against you and against your word, God. The Bible calls that sin. I pray that you forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I pray that you come into my life, you be my Lord, my boss, my Savior, Master. And help me to live my life for you. And if you made that decision for the first time, in just a moment, our worship team is going to lead us in song. We've got a prayer team in the back that would love to talk to you about that decision. Or my wife, Laura, and I will be in the foyer. You can come and tell us about that decision as well. Say, I put my faith and trust in Jesus, and I'm ready to strive to learn about who he is and what he's done for me. Or maybe this morning you say, you know what, I want to make that next step of baptism. I've never been baptized. And it's that going under the water and coming up saying, I'm dead to my old way of life and I'm alive to the newness of Christ. That you can also talk to the prayer team or myself. We've got a baptism coming up next week. So we're excited about God, what you're doing in the life of those who put their faith and trust in you. Or Lord God, maybe it's those of us in here this morning that say, you know what, I'm maybe the unruly. Or maybe I'm the faint-hearted, the small soul today. Or maybe I'm the spiritually weak that needs encouragement. You can join up with us not only on Sunday morning through our life group next hour. 
but also maybe on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock to join up in a Bible study to grow in the Word of God and our understanding of how we can serve God throughout our lives. But Lord God, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful, to be strong, to be encouraged, and to be thankful for the grace that you have given us. I love that ending that Paul says, in the midst of here's what you're commanded to do, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will be with you all. And God, we know that. Your grace that is so great and so marvelous. So we thank you for that. Lord God, be with us this new year as we strive to live our lives for you. It's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.